Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. The fact that you're here means that you want to learn. Hopefully I can share something with you tonight that you can take home and make a change for the better. This is the home and vehicle aspect of preparedness is something that I find the most intriguing. Um, and this particular seminar, as I was explaining earlier, is my most favorite to teach. Mostly because when I switch to a slide, I'll see people start writing down a lot of notes. And basically everybody's taking some sort of note, which tells me you're taking something away from it. And I also had a lot of fun researching and preparing for uh, this one. So with that, let's dive right into home and vehicle. It'll take about an hour, just like most of them do. We might go a little long if I get a little long-winded. We'll go through home preparedness first, and we're gonna go through FBI statistics. We're also gonna go through question, a questionnaire that was given to uh, a very specific group of people, and we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about ways that you can make it better, make your home more hardened, if you will. No cost, simple and inexpensive, elaborate and pricey. We're gonna go through all of that. Then we'll get into vehicle preparedness. We'll talk about strengths and weaknesses of your particular vehicle. We'll talk about some of the benefits, some of the storage areas that maybe you didn't know your vehicle even had or didn't even consider using. And we will talk about some items that I suggest might be helpful. If you have questions, ask your question. You might be stealing my thunder, so I might tell you to just go ahead and jot it down in your notebook, and if I don't cover it at a certain point, then definitely ask it. Start with home preparedness. Home preparedness, everybody will think, usually, everybody will think, I need to be more prepared, and they start at home. That's a great place to start, because it's probably where you spend a majority of your time. Then you probably spend the next majority of your time in your vehicle going to and from places. So starting with home, you have to consider, just like we talked about in the very first seminar, introspectives. What is your most likely scenario? What are your strengths and weaknesses? What is the size of your neighborhood? Is it big? Great, that means you have a lot of people you can rely on. Is it big? Oh no, that means I have a lot more people that I need to worry about. So what can be perceived as a strength should also be evaluated as a weakness. It's not saying it is a one, but you should consider that. Your neighborhood accessibility, are you literally like right off a highway? Can I see your backyard from a major highway thoroughfare that runs through that area? Which means path of least resistance, if something happens, people are gonna be walking down that road or traveling that road, and if they need to resupply, they're gonna look and see your backyard. Does that make you more of a target? Conversely, is your neighborhood so difficult to access that when help comes, you're never gonna know because you're so far back in there. Network, we talked a lot about network last time. Family, friends, neighbors, assets, liabilities. They can be both. You don't have to categorize them into one or the other. And then physical assets and virtual assets. What in the heck is a virtual asset? Well, the last couple of years, we've probably done virtual training or virtual meetings, or if you're watching this after the fact, it's a virtual presentation. Virtual assets are things that you can rely on that aren't tangible. It's not something you have in your hand. Even if you have uh, something like a network attached storage device, a NAS system, that's great. You've got documents on there. But what if you don't have power to power your network? It's not something tangible. So that would be a virtual asset. FBI statistics. This is the fun stuff. All right. Home break-ins occur every 13 seconds. So the time that I've been talking, four minutes, there's been a lot of break-ins that have happened. But 72% occur when the home is unoccupied and 34% of the time, the front door is used. In recent events, recent news, I've seen a sharp uptick in the brazenness of criminals. Abductions, uh, assault and battery, robbery, all in broad daylight, all caught on doorbell cameras or security cameras in some cases. The fact that people think, oh, well, the criminal's gonna go slinking around my back door like it's a Tom and Jerry cartoon. No, they're going path of least resistance. They're going the thing that's easiest to them where they can quickly get in and out. 34% of the time, that's the front door. Most occur between 10 and three. Why? Because you're at work. You're at school, you're at work, you're off doing something. You shouldn't be home between 10 and three pre-COVID. 
July and August are the highest months. Why do we think that is? Vacations. Vacations. Everybody's off at Disneyland. Everybody's out having fun. They're not home. The average burglary loss is $2,400. What do you take away from that? Technology, right. That tells me smash and grab. I'm in and I'm out pretty quick. It also tells me that, quite frankly, it's probably not worth losing my life over. Personally, $2,400, if it's just a burglary, not worth losing my life over. That's what it tells me anyway. Any questions or comments about those statistics? Anybody surprised by those? It, the thing that surprised me the most is the front door part. Mm -hmm. That really surprised me. I fully expected windows. Um, but as we get into this a little bit, you're going to see maybe why that's not the case. So talking about criminal mindset, in 2017, a TV station reached out to a bunch of criminals and gave them a survey. Now, you could take this with a grain of salt because obviously they weren't the best criminals. They did get caught. They did get arrested. They did go to jail. <laughs> take that for what it's worth. But they surveyed them and they answered. They were able to answer anonymously. So the first one, how did you typically break into a home or an apartment? Kicked open a door or a window, right? And a lot of them kicked open the front door because in the, the comment that was left on the survey was I'd rather kick in the door than break glass. Loud bangs are better than loud glass breaking, plus you run the risk of getting cut. <laughs> so they're no different than you and I. They don't want to get hurt. That one, again, surprised me, the front door most of the time, but loud bang, is, is a impulse sound, like a gunshot. Breaking a glass, it's tinkling, and then you're walking all over it, then you're having to keep breaking it out so you don't get cut, and then you probably have to open the door anyway. Next one, once inside, what was the first thing you looked to steal? Jewelry, electronics, credit cards, everything that we just talked about before, right? And the comment there was, an NRA sticker on a car bumper equals lots of guns to steal. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later on, so remember that one. So yeah, collectibles, guns, things like that. If you think you have the best hiding place, you probably don't because these criminals are career criminals. They know where to look. Where did you look? Uh, start in the master bedroom. A lot of us probably hide shit in the master bedroom, master closet. Oh yeah, I've got this secret, secret compartment in my underwear drawer. Well, guess what? Everybody's looking in the underwear drawer first mm -hmm. because it's all in the movies. Uh, they include secret hiding places from the stove and the freezer. I never would have thought to hide anything in a stove or a freezer, but that's where these people look because they're, they've done it enough to know to look there. Fish tank, toilet tank, bookshelves, boxes of cereal. I really, like I said, I like doing the research on this because it gave me insight into that criminal mindset. You, to beat something, you have to understand something. You have to understand the criminal mindset to overcome the criminal mindset, to be better than they are. That's why the New England Patriots videotaped their, their opponents and, you know, what was that, Spygate. And that's why the Houston Astros used the camera in center field to steal the signs from the catcher. You got to understand them to get them. What time of day? Early morning or afternoon? Because either you're not home for lunch yet or you're already gone after lunch and the kids aren't home from school. Did home protection or security signs deter you? Some stated it didn't really alter their plans at all. One actually stated it helped them. How in the hell could a sign help them? Well, if you advertise what system you have, the criminals now know how to safely attack your home. So if you say, oh, yeah, I've got ADT. Good, I know how to kill an ADT system. I know how to bypass it. If, I don't want to steal my own thunder. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, did pets in the home like a dog make you think twice? Oh, I've got the dog. The dog's gonna, you know, it's a big St. Bernard. It's gonna scare everybody away. Larger breeds? Sure, okay. That ankle biter that you could drop kick over the back fence probably is not doing much for you. I know it's cute and it looks neat in a little bag, but no. Did you typically knock on the front door before you break into home? Every single one of them said yes. Every single one. One. Who's answered their door for somebody they don't know? Recently, within the last six months. Right. One, two people. Do you have cameras in your house or something, some way that you could identify the person before you open the door? Yes. 
Well, we can also talk we'll to them if we're not home. Okay. Can you see around the corner? No. So if somebody's knocking on your door, how do you know it's just one person and there isn't somebody hiding right around the corner? We've got cameras front and back inside. You must have blind spots. Oh, definitely. Yeah, right. Yeah. So if they know where the cameras are or if they can see them or if they've already cased the house, they might know where those are. I tend not to open the door for somebody I don't know, right? I opt to talk to them through a, a video doorbell or through the door or something like that. Probably better, even if it's the solar panel salesman that comes down twice a week, whatever. You just don't know. You just don't know. Helpful? Like, say you're not home. You're mm -hmm. not home, right? But they don't know you're not home. True. Because you can talk to them. If you always talk to them through that, and let's say it's the same person that's come back three, four times, mm -hmm. and the first three times you talk to them through the door, but the last time you talk to them over the video doorbell, mm -hmm. they might make the assumption that, well, she's not on the other side to talk to me, mm -hmm. so she's not here. No, that's, true. that's something to just take yeah. into consideration, which sounds like I'm going way off the deep end, right? But consider what you're looking at on the screen. Consider what we're going through. Criminal mindset. If someone answered the door, what would you do or say? <laughs> These ones are interesting. But what did we talk about last time? Well, that's a way you can access just about anywhere. Hard hat, high-vis vest, and a clipboard. Mm -hmm. I would wear nice clothing, print a questionnaire off the internet, carry a clipboard for some anonymous survey. Now, if this is sounding like somebody that's knocked on your door recently, <laughs> Hopefully you still sleep at night. If the home alarm system went off, what would you do? Well, try to turn it off or get the hell out of there. Very few, uh, most said they would leave immediately, but a few of them would stick around regardless. They didn't care. A home alarm system does what? Draws attention, alerts the authorities if you have it set up that way. What do these people already don't care about? It's between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. They're coming through the front door. Do you think they care about attention? No. If a security camera was visible, would, you, would it keep you from breaking in? Most said, yeah. Mind you, this was from 2017. That's when this survey was taken. It's already five years old. Take that into consideration. Now the video doorbells are far more common. So I would say... If this same questionnaire were posed to criminals that were arrested within the last six months, the answers would probably be different to this question. Some stated that the presence of cameras likely meant there were valuables inside. So some said, yeah, it was a deterrent. Others said, no, it was actually uh, more reason to be at the right house. Did lights on in the home make you think twice? Some stated this was a deterrent. Some. One made an interesting comment. I would drive through upper class neighborhoods looking for many things like a porch light on and windows and blinds closed. Why? Why would they do that? Yeah. Right, just on. So, so things like timers can be very helpful here. Oh, that's just an answer. Yeah, timers. Mm -hmm. Come on randomly, shut off 30 minutes later in different rooms in the house. That can be helpful. but. The, the other interesting to, thing to take away from this one is I would drive through upper class neighborhoods. A lot of people say, oh, I bought a home that's in a great neighborhood. If I'm a criminal, I'm going where the money is. The money's in the good neighborhood. It's not in the hood, right? It's not in the projects. It's not in the, the trailer parks. The money, the valuable stuff is in the upper class neighborhoods. That's where I'm going. If you heard a TV or a radio on inside the home, would you still break in? Nearly all stated they would not. Who, who remembers... We did this a lot when I was growing up. You leave the radio on for the dog. Yeah, leave the radio on for the dog or put the, the Animal Planet channel on for the cat or something like that so they could chase things around. Apparently, that worked better than we thought. It wasn't just being crazy. Would it make a difference if there was a vehicle in the driveway? Almost everyone said they'd think twice. Most of the time, that's a true sign of someone being home. Most of the time, uh, you've got two adults living at the home with children, let's say. Each adult has one vehicle. Vehicles park in the garage. Unless you don't have a clean garage, and then you park in the driveway. But then they drive by and they know, hey, always two cars parked in the driveway. Now both cars are gone. Two adults live here with two kids. Safe to assume that nobody's home. 
or at least no adult is home. Who parks their vehicle in the driveway when they normally park in the garage when they go on vacation? So if you normally park in the garage, who parks their vehicle in the driveway when you go on vacation? Don't raise your hands, but consider it. What is your ideal target for a burglary? Most stated they did not want to be seen, so they look for homes that hide their presence. Homes away from other homes, blind spots, older windows and frames, cheap wooden doors, large trees, bushes, or shrubs, conservative or reserved neighborhoods. That's very detailed. Like, they're down to looking at how old are the window frames in your house. That's incredibly detailed. So there's a lot of thought that goes into this. So the next one, did you ever surveil your target? Some stated, yeah. Others said, yeah. Basically, I just showed up, found one I liked, and hit it. Didn't do any. So think the, the Ocean's Eleven kind of stuff, probably not going to happen on your house. It's probably going to be more crime of opportunity. Happen to be driving through the neighborhood, no cars in the driveway, lights on at 11 p.m., all the lights are on, probably nobody home. If you did surveillance, what were you trying to figure out? Who lives in the home? What are their weekly schedules? What they drive? Is there a dog and is there a hidden key? If there's a hidden key, that's an easy way to not make much noise. Especially if you don't set your alarm. So if you've got a hidden key hiding under the flower pot, not on your front step, but the next step down, right? Where most people, I'm not going to put it here. Everybody looks under the mat. I'm going to hide it down a step. I'm going to be clever. These people are looking in freezers and stoves for valuables. They know where your hidden key is. They just do. What is the one thing homeowners can do to avoid being bur burglarized? Most said good lighting with trim bushes and trees. Don't give them a place to hide. Right now, think of your own home. If you were looking at it from the street, honestly, could you find a place to hide at 1130 at night from a car driving by the road out in front of your house? Yeah, probably. So do you think criminals are seeing things that way too? They're probably better at it than we are because it's what they do. Consider adding lighting. Try not to point the lighting at your house. Why? You're blinding yourself. You've got to look out the blind to see if somebody's out there. You're looking into 350 lumens staring right at you. Put the lights close to your home and shine them away from your home. That way, just like using a flashlight. I don't use a flashlight like this and put it at my face to see what's out there. I point it out there to see what's out there. Treat your home the same way. Don't put the lighting at your house. Point it away from your house. A lot of people like to have the big, tall uh, Arborvitae or something similar. Oh, they look so pretty. They're great. The crepe myrtles look awesome. They do. And in full bloom, those are really easy to hide behind. If you've got bushes near the house, consider putting some little solar lights or something uh, that is, doesn't use a lot of energy. Put them behind in between the bushes in the house. That way a criminal can't step back there and be immediately in the dark and hiding. Put bars in your windows and doors. Probably not something we want to do, right? Because it kind of alters the look of the house. Get an alarm. Keep an extra car in the driveway. Leave lights and radio on. Uh, alert police to anything suspicious. That last bit right there. Who in the last six months has called the police on somebody? I have. I love calling the police and the people that knock on my door. Well, I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm just from the power company. Did you know that such and such a bill just passed? They don't have any identification. I'm not answering the door for them, but I will call the police. Hey, uh, you know, here locally it's 911. 911, police, fire, or, uh, or medic. Uh, would you please send a police officer? Sure, sir, what's the address and what's going on? Give them the address. There's a suspicious person. They're walking around. They're claiming to be from this company. They have no identification. I would like an officer to please just talk with them and make sure they're not doing something nefarious. Cool. It's not a, you're not distressed. You're not yelling. They're not going to come with lights and sirens going, but an officer will drive through the neighborhood. They'll make contact with the person. They'll ask them for identification. Guess what? If they have a warrant, they're going to be off your street. If they're there doing something legitimate, they'll let them go. Continue on their way. In today's day and age, a lot of people are, ah, I don't want to get involved. I don't want it. You always see it on the news. Some wacko goes ape. 
and they're interviewing the neighbors. Man, I always knew there was something wrong with him. You never called. You never told anybody. Why? Well, it wasn't my play. I didn't want to get involved. Be involved. Be a part of that network. Be the neighbor you would want your neighbor to be for you. Look out for each other. You're calling the officer at, or requesting an officer, just talk to this person. Make sure they are who they say they are. That's all you're asking. You're not saying, hey, this guy's doing something criminal. He needs to be arrested. No, you're saying just, can an officer talk to him? They're on official duty. They've got gear and training that helps keep them safe. Call them. Use them. Your taxpayer dollars pay for it. Questions about that? Who thought, uh, who thought that was interesting? Okay. Occasionally, you get into this mindset of a gear acquisition syndrome. And if you built a kit, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, oh, there's always something newer, always something better, always something that, oh, if I had just saved an extra 10 bucks, I could have just, ah, why did I buy the buyer's remorse, right? Your lock on your house does not need to be Fort Knox grade. It's just got to be better than your neighbor's. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You got to be faster than your friend. <laughs> That's the way it goes. I told the story when, when we talked about lock picking, uh, my neighbor across the street, right? She locked herself out of a house. I was able to pick her deadbolt and get her in her house. That opened my eyes to then try my own house and I was able to get in. It's like, okay, well, if I change my locks, they don't have to be the best locks in the world but I want a different style of lock rather than a traditional pin and tumbler design. I wanted something different, so I got something different. Didn't have to be the best, but it just had to be something better than what was around me because they're going to be looking for something that is more familiar and easy. Now, all that said, is a criminal going to take the time to pick a door lock? No, probably just going to kick the door open, right? We've already read that. So there's more steps that you can take to make it harder. It buys you time. Yeah. That's what most all of these measures are going to do, is buy you time. Mm -hmm. Given enough time, anything is penetrable. Seen the movie Firestarter with Drew Barrymore, right? Anything will burn if it gets hot enough. Mm -hmm. Given enough time, criminals will find a way in. What you're looking for is to buy you time for your alarm system to alert the authorities, for the authorities to show up. What is the average response time in your neighborhood? I don't know. Consider looking at that. Talk to an officer. They're likely out patrolling. You see them. Have a bottle of water for them. Hey, thanks for doing what you do. Quick question for you. What's the average response time? They might not know, but you know what? They'll probably put you in touch with the local, um, the local person for that division that understands those statistics, right? The, the, person that talks to the media. They'll put you in touch with them because they don't want to answer. Probably because they're on body camera and they don't want to sound like a clown. So what can we do? Well, let's start with no cost habit changes. Let's start there. The very first thing is what? Observe your surroundings. Get to know the cars that come in and out of your neighborhood that go up and down your street. Get to know your neighbor's car. Hey, you know, did you see Joan got a new car last week? Yeah, looks good. She finally traded in that old piece of crap that was leaking oil everywhere. Got something better. Cool. Observe your surroundings. That's going to be your first form of deterrent, and that is a no-cost habit change. You can go home right now and just take an extra spin around the block. Just start to get to know what cars are in what driveways. Next, don't advertise. For the love of God, do not advertise what you have. Valuable security measures. Things like that. Hey, you know, I've got just bought a brand new 64 gun safe. So you've got enough stuff to fill a 64 gun safe. I just bought a brand new 75 inch plasma TV. Probably mounted on the wall, probably not very heavy. Cool. Probably in the great room, the living room, which is where the sliding glass door is. Hot piece of cake. Try not to advertise, you know, protected by Glock. My favorite one. <laughs> Oh, there's a, there's a picture that's going around, and it said, uh, it, was, it was on the back window of a vehicle, and it said something like, certain gun manufacturer inside, and literally the back window was broken open right underneath that sticker. It was the funniest thing I've probably ever seen, and unfortunately, that person had to, had to ask the question, why my car? Well, you know, kel or Springfield Armory, or NRA... Don't advertise. 
and I'd go so far as to say, don't advertise any political affiliations that you have. Because when a road rage incident happens and you cut off the wrong knucklehead and they've had a bad day, you may wish you hadn't put that sticker on your car. Proud parent of an honor student at such and such a school. My favorite probably is the uh, stick figure families on the backs of cars. Now I know exactly how many people live in your house. I know the rough ages of them. I know how many pets you have. I know what sports they're into. And I probably know where they play those sports and where they go to school because you put it all over the back of your car. And most people's passwords are what? Their children's or pets' names, schools they've went to, graduating years. People are not smart, right? Everybody says, oh my God, I got hacked. You literally on Facebook said, hey, this is my mother, and this was her maiden name, and this is my hometown, and this is where I graduated high. You wonder why you get hacked. You freely and openly offer up all that information to these criminals who are out there looking for that stuff. Don't advertise. Please don't advertise. Keep your garage door closed. Even if you're in a good neighborhood, keep your garage door closed. Years ago, I had a boss who lived up on the lake in a yacht club neighborhood. Garage door left open, somebody came to steal the golf clubs out the garage door. Garage door wide open, they ran into the garage, stole the golf clubs, luckily they caught the plate. Cops caught them, you know what they were? They were career criminals out of Georgia who were going around these high class neighborhoods and stealing shit that they could easily turn quickly. Like a nice set of golf clubs. It's probably untraceable. Keep your doors and windows locked. It seems crazy in today's day and age where that even has to be on here. Lock your front door when you get home. Lock the door between your garage and your house. Why? Probably because that little clicker that opens your garage door is either hard-coded into your car or up under the dash or on the sun visor or something like that. S smash the window, push the button, now I have access to your garage. And if you don't lock that door between your garage and your house, now I have access to your house and I didn't have to break anything but a car window. Uh, keep your blinds and curtains partially or fully closed. There's energy savings to this, right? If you keep your blinds closed, your house doesn't turn into a greenhouse. But also, it makes it harder for anybody walking by on the sidewalk or driving by in a car slowly to look into your house. If you've got blinds open, blinds open, I can see right through your house. I can see if anybody's moving around. I can see roughly the layout of your home. If you have any security measures inside, that's all stuff that we can do. You put the Christmas tree right up at the front window, leave the windows open at Christmas time with the lights on so everybody can see your beautiful tree. Newsflash, uh, nobody gives a shit about your tree. I'm sorry, they probably have their own at home they're looking at. And leaving those windows open or just the blinds open, it's just inviting people to look inside your house. And you're inviting maybe the wrong person. Trim your foliage, bush height and placement. As a rule of thumb, it is encouraged that no bushes are taller than three feet. Why? Well, because when a human body creatures, crouches down on the ground, yes, they can absolutely get less than three feet, but it's tough. It's tough. Especially if you've got some, your hands full of stuff, right? Try to crouch down behind something. Placement. Don't put them too close to the house because you don't want to deal with mold, but also that gives that criminal an opportunity to hide. They're going to jump into that bush. Oh, well, thorny bushes work. Not if I've got heavy clothes. I don't care. We've all walked through the woods at some point or a briar field and then got out and went, oh, my gosh, I got this stuff all over me. Had no idea. Because you had pants on. You had boots on. You had a sweatshirt on. They can help, but usually in much warmer climates. Set the alarm you have. If you have an alarm, set the alarm. It doesn't do anybody any good if you've got this wonderful, beautiful, awesome thing that you never use. Use it. Develop the network. We talked about that. And stop posting on social media. Hey, I checked into such and such a place. Cool, now I know where you are. Hey, we're going on vacation this week, going to Disney, first time at Disney. Cool. All right. And you just bought that new TV? All right. When do you leave? My favorite is when people post photos of their plane tickets. Because now I know your legal name. I know where you're going to. I know roughly how long you're going to be there. I know when you're going to be in the air, so the security company cannot get in hold of you to say, is this a false alarm? Right? Don't post pictures of stuff like that. Bragging about valuables. Um, who's seen the terminal list 
on Amazon. Handful. Go check it out. It's kind of heavy. Watch it. There's a, a scene in there where an individual was easily tracked because every single morning he posts a picture of where he was going for coffee. And he basically posted his whole life on there, on social media. Real easy to track somebody with that. Real easy. And again, with recent news, again, criminals being very, very brazen, abducting people in broad daylight, robbing people in broad daylight, that's not the kind of attention you want. Not saying, no offense, that any of you are important enough for somebody to do that to you, but if it's easy, and they don't have to work too hard. All right, simple and inexpensive. So we've gone from no cost to now a little bit of money. Install blinds. If you don't have blinds or curtains, install them. It doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Upgrade the locking mechanisms on your doors, right? I, I have in here practical demonstration. I just kind of told you about it, right? I don't have to have the best lock in the world. I just got to be better than my neighbors. It's got to be better than, uh, what is it called, Martin? Better than residential grade, right? You don't go to Home Depot and buy the cheapest thing they have. Don't go to Walmart, buy a great value lock. Install exterior lighting. Flood versus motion. There's, you're going to find a lot of debate on, should the lights be on all the time? Should they only come on when somebody walks by? Figure out what works for you. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Why can't it be both? Why put yourself into one or the other bucket? Have lights that are on all the time and then install motion ones. Because then they're going to think, oh, these lights are on all the time. And then they walk by something and it kicks on. Did somebody turn that on? Or is it a motion light? Entry sensors. Not a security system, but you can buy just little chimes. You install them on doors, windows, so every time you open it up, it makes this really annoying high decibel sound. It can chime. It can alarm. They're inexpensive. You can install them on any door or window that you fear may be opened without your knowledge. Install or advertise a faux security system. So if you don't have a security system, have, steal your neighbor's sign and stick it in your yard. I don't know. You can buy ADT signs on eBay. You can buy fake security signs on Amazon, I'm sure. Put up fake security cameras. It's, not, it's, a, it's a lower cost option than a full system. Put some lights on timers. It's kind of something we talked about earlier on, right? Find timers. They can be inexpensive, three packs, stick them in different rooms in the house. And then every week, just change what room that is. Football Sunday, all right, yep, change the timers around. And protect, uh, procure fire extinguishers. Not every emergency is going to be a break-in. Fire extinguishers. Wherever you have the ability to hurt yourself or catch something on fire, put a fire extinguisher, put a medical kit. We talked about that, I think, in the first one. Now, on to some pricey options. Install a full monitored security system. If you've got the funds to do it, do it. Install video surveillance equipment. Know what's going on around your property. This is becoming more and more achievable every day. It's becoming more, I want to say inexpensive, but technology over time becomes less expensive than it was when it first came out. It's no longer new. They're onto something different. Uh, trust what you're putting in though. And when we get to digital privacy and security, when we talk about that, I'm going to bring up uh, security systems as well. Just be careful with who you're entrusting your information to, especially a video camera. Install glass applications. So there's a, I think it's 3M. Is it 3M that does the panels? You could buy this film and put it on a window. And it doesn't change the appearance of the window if you don't want it to. There's clear, there's tinted. And it basically turns it into what a windshield would be, right? Which is you can break it, you can poke a hole through it, but it doesn't just shatter and fall away. So it almost becomes a laminated system at that point. There's some really good videos of people testing it, shooting it with guns, hitting it with sledgehammers, throwing bricks at it. It's not perfect because, you, again, given enough time, they'll come through. But what does it buy you? buys you time. Time to hear somebody trying to break through a window means you can get out. Or call the authorities and have them show up while they're still trying to break in. And then establish and install physical barriers. Fencing. We talk about prickly bushes. In warmer climates, they absolutely can help. 
in cooler climates, maybe less so. But prickly bush doesn't necessarily mean roses or cactus. Prickly bush could mean something that looks like a bush that isn't a bush. But also understand your insurance company might not like that very much either. And all that to say if you install security systems or other protective measures, your homeowner's insurance may go down. Because you've made your home less of a target to criminals, your insurance company might look at that as less risky. And insurance is all about risk, risk management. When someone tries to break in through the front door, they're going to do it in one swift kick. Very likely it's going to be one swift kick. If you don't believe me, watch police enter houses. They're trained to do it. You can buy longer screws and take the screws out of your strike plates and put longer ones in. Because the ones that are in your strike plates are probably about half, three quarter inch long, inch if you're lucky. Buy a three inch decking screw and get it through the entire frame. It's not gonna be perfect and that door will still eventually give, not the door necessarily, but the jam itself. But what does it buy you? It buys you time. And maybe it's not one kick, now maybe it's four or five kicks. Conversely, on the other side, on the hinge side, you could buy these special hinges that just look normal, but you basically lose a screw out of one of them and it goes back into the door. So instead of all the screws being in this side and all the screws being in this side, you take a screw out of this side and maybe it's a screw that goes in here and it sticks out a little bit. So when the door shuts, the door shuts into that. So now you've got the screw going into the wall, but it's also sticking into the door. There's whole hinges you can replace. There's just screws that you can replace to do that. All of those things buy you time. The little latch, little flip it over. That's great, but those tiny little screws are in here. And if it's an interior door, it's probably hollow core. It's not solid. I just punch my hand through that door. And it's gonna hurt, but there's nothing there. It's a tiny little thin piece of MDF space, tiny little thin piece of MDF. So what are those screws really attached to? I'm not saying it won't work. I'm just saying understand what you're getting and how much time it's going to buy you. Yeah, the, the screws are something that, in my opinion, everyone should do. Because it is so inexpensive, you can do it with hand tools. It's kind of a pain in the tuchus, but you can do it. Get a power drill, pop the old ones out, pop the new ones in. And, see, you, you see the, the latches on the doors. You shut it, it goes click, but there's always that weird little, like, bubble thing on the back of it. You know that bubble thing's not actually supposed to go into that void. The bubble thing is supposed to stay depressed, whereas the whole latch goes in, right, and then everything goes in back, the latch is supposed to come forward, and this little thing on the back is supposed to stay back. That prevents the little credit card trick, where you slide the credit card in, you just poop, and then the whole door opens. So if you go home tonight, and your front door, you shut it, and that little pin in behind the latch also goes into the void, then whoever installed that just did it quickly and didn't necessarily care about how it was supposed to line up. <coughs> a lot of builders, they'll buy oversized latches, uh, strike plates, just because it's a cheap, cheaper option. And I know that I can use this on every door handle out there. I don't have to buy a specific one for each door handle. I just buy the biggest one, the door shuts, customer doesn't ask questions. Check for that when you go home tonight. Any other questions before we get into vehicle preparedness? Any questions before we get into vehicle preparedness about it? All right. You have to evaluate your vehicle. Strengths and weaknesses. We talked about location, population, density, and all that kind of stuff in the last class when we talked about network. But apply this to your vehicle. Is your vehicle suited for the location you're in? Do you have a Lamborghini and you live up a dirt road? I don't know. Do you have a four-wheel drive vehicle and you live in Europe and you can't park the thing anywhere? I don't know. Your vehicle specifically, age, size, fuel range, reliability, is it domestic or is it foreign? How easily are you going to be able to find parts for that thing? These are all things you need to take into consideration. What is the reliability of my vehicle? When things go wrong, what does go wrong? Buy spare parts. Have the tools to fix it. Spare fuses, spare bolts, like we talked about last time. Have that stuff in your car's EDC, your vehicle kit. And resources, a manual. 
If your vehicle doesn't have a manual, didn't come with one, buy one. And don't rely on a PDF that you can download and keep on your phone, because what if your phone dies? And now your vehicle can't start, so you can't charge your phone. Have a manual, keep it in the car. They used to be, what are they, the Haynes, the Haynes manuals, the Haynes repair manuals? Those used to be a thing. I think they still might be. Consider getting one of those if your car didn't come with one, and maybe even if it did. Traditional vehicle benefits. Everybody knows a vehicle can get you places faster, give you protection from the elements, it's got lights, you can offer defensive protection if somebody throws a stone at you, you can offer offensive protection if somebody won't get out of your way and they're pointing a gun at you. 4,000 pounds traveling at 70 miles an hour carries a hell of a lot of energy. Or in your case, I guess what, seven or 8,000 pounds. Well, yeah, mine's yeah. <laughs> Additional vehicle benefits, things that maybe you didn't consider. You got a radio in there. I know nobody uses it anymore, but it still is in there. Comes with the car, promise you. You can get informed on what the hell's going on outside your vehicle. AM, FM radio still works. Still very effective. Climate controlled space. When it's hot out, you've got AC. When it's cold out, you've got heat. As long as you have fuel. Generator. The alternator in a car charges the battery. The alternator is run by that big engine, which is fed by the fuel tank in the back. So your car is just a big generator, unless you drive a Tesla. Then you carry a generator to charge your car, as we've all seen in California recently. It's a, it's a battery backup. Even if the, battery, uh, the, the car is out of fuel, your battery will still have life in it, albeit for a shortened period of time because it's no longer being charged, but your battery will still have power until it's depleted. It's a signaling device. How? Well, I flash my lights, honk my horn. It's a car that's probably got a gas tank that's full of fuel. I could light some bitch on fire if I had to, right? Big fire usually attracts a lot of attention. Probably from the people you want to help you, the first responders, the fire, police, those kinds of folks. I'm not saying light your cars on fire. I'm just saying understand that it's a possibility if it were absolutely dire circumstances. What else? What else can you think your vehicle can do as an additional benefit? Somebody must have used their car for something that helped them out at some point in life. There's no way I exhausted the list. Come on. Yeah. Recovery. Recovery of yourself or others. Yeah. Sleeping. Shelter. Ready built shelter. Yeah. Be careful when you use the bag to start a fire. Yes, absolutely. You can use the battery to start a fire. So it's a, basically a mobile survival cache. Fill it full of stuff and it goes wherever you want it to go, provided you have the ability to move it. Fuel, whatever that is. So set your vehicle up for success. Your, vehicle health, your vehicle's health is important, not so dissimilar from your own. Your physical fitness ability matters. Your vehicle's health matters. Make sure all the fluids are topped off. Make sure it's got regular maintenance, just like we talked about in the last, uh, last seminar. Build it its EDC bag. Give it its own lifeline, right? Don't let your vehicle become your coffin. Don't get so stuck thinking, I just got to stay with my car. I just got to stay with my car. That you run out of resources, but you're like, no, no, I, I know help definitely has to come tomorrow. Don't let it become your coffin. Know when to leave your vehicle behind. That's not probably the first hour, unless you ran out of gas and you know there's a gas station, I can see it on the horizon, okay, leave your vehicle, get, go get what you need. But know when you should leave it. If day three, day four, you haven't seen a soul, probably time to affect your own survival rather than sit and be passive about it. So vehicle storage area, something you already kind of you know, stole my thunder a little bit on, but I, I let you have it. Sorry. No, you're fine. There's a lot of spots. I mean, goodness, what do I have up here? Six, 12. 12 that I could think of just right off the top. Every vehicle is going to be slightly different. You may have under seat storage in the back of a truck that you could literally buy a thing and put a safe back there and store long guns or whatever it is. All of this is just what I came up with. But consider your own vehicle. Maybe you don't have a trunk because you have an SUV. Okay, cool. 
Do you have a spare tire under there? Have you ever looked under there? Do you have a spare tire or do you have the repair kit, which is a can of fix a flat and a jack? You know, some vehicles have that now. Some vehicles have full-size spares. Some vehicles have the donuts. What does your vehicle have? Do you know what your vehicle has? When was the last time you checked if you have a full-size spare? When was the last time you checked the tire pressure on it? When was the last time you checked for dry rot? Is that, can that vehicle even hold air? Will it hold up to 55 miles an hour on the highway? When you buy new tires, do you buy five or do you buy four? What does that look like? Sun visors. There's these really cool little panels that you can buy. Some are really cheap, some are really good. You can put them on your, your visor. Turn it into a molly or a hook and loop storage system. Fieldcraft survival cells are a really interesting one that you can put up there. Um, under your front seat. Communication is important, right? So AM, FM radio. I have an amateur radio, ham radio in my car. The body of the radio lives under the front seat and there is so much storage under there. I also have a fire extinguisher in my car, under the front seat, under the driver's seat, so I can reach it while I'm seated in the car. If God forbid I was stuck and the engine compartment was on fire and for some reason the firewall wasn't doing its job. Can you reach the tools you need if you are pinned? Uh, under the cargo area, we talked about that, spare tire, back of the front seat. Everybody's got that stupid little map pocket that no matter what you put in it somehow seems to expand it to the point where it's warped. Dumbest idea ever. I don't even know how that's possible. They make the um, little things that you could buy. You can strap it to the seat and then it turns it into a hook and loop or a molly system where you can attach other things. And if you've got children, that can be a lifesaver. That's where your iPad goes. That's where the spare battery is. That's where your snacks are, you angry little beast. All that stuff can be very helpful, not just for I'm in dire need of medical assistance or anything like that. It might just be something as simple as if these kids don't stop fighting, I'm literally going to drive it off the cliff and then we will be in a survival situation. <laughs> Things like that can help. Helpful items, spare tire. Again, check your spare. Check that you have a spare. Have a good jack that you can get the car off the ground with. If you bought a used vehicle, check to make sure that thing's still in the damn car. Because the last time, the last time that you want to find out that you don't have one is when you need one. It's no different than a medical kit, right? Uh, lug wrench. Do you have a wheel that's got special lock lugs on it? Do you have the tool to get those off? Because mechanics don't carry everything. Have the tools you need. Fix a flat can be very helpful. A can of fix a flat and a tire plug kit will get you a lot of places. Jumper cables. Everybody thinks, oh, I should keep a set of jumper cables in the car because the battery's going to go dead. Probably more likely you're going to have a flat tire than a dead battery. Battery technology has come a long way. It's still not great, but it's come a long way. Fire extinguisher. Show of hands, who's got a fire extinguisher in their car right now in the parking lot? Four. There's 15 of you in this room. Should be 15 hands. There's your first one. A shovel. It's not always going to be snow. Might be mud. Might be rocks. You just need leverage, right? Use it as a fulcrum. Shovels can be very helpful. Spare fuses and spare bulbs we talked about last time. Toe strap, talked about that last time too. Zip ties. <sighs> Plastic duct tape, that's basically what it is. Zip ties goes a long way. Where you can't reach down to wrap duct tape, you can probably get a zip tie in there. I would also include something like uh, electrical tape if that were something that you wanted to carry. And there's a lot of other things. Who else has got something in their vehicle that they've used a lot that they would recommend to most everybody? Duct yeah, tape. duct tape, yeah. Uh, flares. Flares, roadside flares. Okay. Use them to start a fire. Or yeah. Or signal that, hey, there's, there's something in, uh, somebody on the side of the road at night, maybe change in a tire, throw a flare out. Consider this. Emergency service vehicles, whether it's police car or the AA truck or AAA truck, not the AA truck, Jesus, AAA truck, um, yeah, it was a slow one for some of you, but you got it. Those vehicles get hit. Officers on the side of the highway helping people, their cars get absolutely totaled. It's moths to a flame. Consider that having no light might be better than having the hit me flashing light. I'm not saying flares are bad, 
don't take it that way at all. Understand pros and cons to everything that you're going to use. Police cars get absolutely totaled frequently in this. That's why they have the law. You have to move over for emergency vehicles because they're getting absolutely creamed. You ever ridden a bike, look at a tree and you crash into the tree? Who rides motorcycles? Show hands, motorcycles. What do they teach you in MSF course? Don't look at the thing you don't want to hit because you get target fixation, you run into it. You will go where you're looking. It's not a whole lot different in a car. You will go where you're looking. If somebody's looking at that flare, they're going to hit the flare, especially drunks. I sound like a doomsday, and I, I promise I'm really not that type of person. <laughs> if nothing else, I've opened your mind to other thoughts that maybe you haven't had. So you might say, oh, God, he's a freaking weirdo. He did say one thing that kind of resonated with me, but the rest of it was shit. Okay, cool. <laughs> if you take one thing away, I've done my job. I carry extra fuel. Extra fuel. Yeah, absolutely. And I also carry additive. Additive. Okay. So like an octane booster or something? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. For the diesel. No, oh, for, right. Yeah, yeah, because I put it in the back. Right. Uh, I got a little uh, bottle jack. Mm -hmm. Bottle jacks are great. I've got, I had one yeah. in the kit that I had yeah. last time. And then a block or two of a piece of wood in case I got to block the tires when I'm picking it up. What about for something under the bottle jack to disperse the weight? That's what I'm saying. I got yeah, okay. blocks. Cool. Yeah. So adjacent communities that you can learn from. The overlanding community. These people live out of their vehicles. That's what they do for fun. It's vehicle sustained travel for long periods of time. Traveling mechanics like the AAA person, they know how to do some bodge repairs on the side of the highway that get you where you need to go. It's not going to be the best repair. It's probably not going to last terribly long, but they can get you to where you need to go. These are great communities to learn from on forums, on YouTube, on different places like that. Consider checking those out. And then we talked about it last time, education, procurement, and building. Whenever you're setting up your home or your vehicle, educate yourself. A tool is only useful in, in the hands of somebody who knows how to use it properly, right? Learn how to use what you're going to use. Educate yourself on the type of scenarios you think you might run into. You don't have to be an expert, but know enough to be dangerous. Know enough to get the job done the right way. There's many resources, vet the instructors. Understand how it pertains to you and your situations. Anything I'm telling you here tonight, same thing. Just because I said it doesn't mean it's the way it should be for you. I have no reason to lie to you, so I'm not going to lie to you. So it's truth, but does it even pertain to you? Do you even own a motorcycle? No, probably not. Then anything I would tell you on motorcycles it could be true, but it doesn't pertain to you. Don't forget to factor yourself into the equations. Right? If you don't know how to use the tool, you're probably more likely to get hurt using the tool. Procurement. Don't go cheap. If you can, don't go cheap. Buy quality stuff that you can do, that you can use, that your wallet can afford. Buy individual items, put the kits together yourselves. Don't buy a vehicle preparedness kit from some schmuck standing up in front of a room talking to you, right? I'm never going to sell you a vehicle preparedness kit because I don't know what tools you can use. I don't know what kind of vehicle you have. I could give you a can of Fix-A-Flat that's good for a sedan and you could drive an F-350 or a Dually. doesn't do you any good. Know what you need, educate yourself on it, then procure it. Put it together yourself. Get redundancies whenever you can where it makes sense from a cost, weight, and space standpoint. Also. Put items that get used frequently in very accessible places. I talked about fire extinguisher under the driver's seat. It's not in the trunk. It doesn't do me any good in the trunk. It might do somebody else good in the trunk. It doesn't do me any good back there. First aid kit. Can you reach your first aid kit from where you're sitting in your car? Can you re reach the tool that's going to cut the seatbelt and break the glass from where you're sitting in the car? I don't know. Educate yourself. Procure the items that you need that you know how to use and put them together in a manner that makes sense. Kit types and placement. Vehicle escape tools should be in reach of every passenger that's normally in the vehicle. If it's just your car, you're the only person that ever sits in that car, maybe you only need one. But if, you're, if you've got a family car, you're a parent, you drive three kids everywhere, there should be at least four things in there, right? And they should know how to use them. Trauma kit, maybe back of the driver's seat, something that you can reach, easily 
or the back seat passenger could reach easily, or somebody who you told to go to your car, it's on the back of the driver's seat, big red pouch, just grab it and come back. Vehicle kit, right? The thing I showed in the last seminar, big thing that's your vehicle's EDC bag, maybe in the cargo area, because it's not something you need immediately. You'll have time, I need to change a tire. All right, well, all the stuff's in the back, I gotta get it out anyway. Probably you're gonna have to go back there to get the tire anyway. talked about a lot and I only ran over by four two minutes Ooh, even better that's saying something for me there's a lot of information a lot of information what questions what comments do you have nothing quiet group this is my favorite one to teach I said that at the beginning because it's a lot of information but it's a lot of cool information that you probably hadn't thought about for me it was the criminal mindset Getting into the mind of a criminal who breaks into houses for a living, albeit probably not good because they got arrested, but they've got insight to offer that I wouldn't think about because I don't live in a criminal mindset. Questions, comments? Quiet one tonight. A lot yeah. Of to do. We have a lot of things to do. We have a front door. We just replaced our front door with a new front door. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Those Little like things. skinny windows. Yeah. Yeah. They come all the way from the ceiling, all the way from the top of the door, all the way down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's thick, double pane glass. Okay. Okay. If they're going to try and break that glass to reach in and do the mm -hmm. thing to get in, do you think I should put some of that film, like you were saying, on the inside of that window so that they can't break that glass? I don't think it's a bad idea. I think having the film, it will prevent the glass from shattering, is what it's going to do. Which means, if I want to make a hole big enough for my arm to fit through, I've got to work to make the hole big enough for my arm to fit through. It's just buying you time. If you hear glass break, by the time you hear it break and get up out of the chair or whatever, that lock might already be turned. If you have the film on there, and you hear glass break, or you hear a noise that you're unfamiliar with, by the time you get up, you might walk over and see him reaching in the door. And there's a really interesting video going around of somebody reaching through the mail slot in an old front door trying to reach up and do that. Somebody came over with a bat and just absolutely tattooed them, right? It changed their attitude. Guess what? They didn't try to reach in anymore. They moved on, probably to the hospital. It would give you time to take action, whether action is offensive in nature or defensive in nature, and whatever that is. that glass, it's not going to just break. Correct. It's not just coming It's out. not just going to break yeah, and shatter and fall. Really get after. You, you, right, exactly. Watch the demonstrations online before you choose to do anything. But I don't. Special? You could just look for 3M. Martin, what's it called? 3M film? 3M. Security film. Security film. Yeah, security film. That would be a good one to look at. And just watch a demonstration on it. I mean, they, sh they shoot it with guns, they hit it with sledgehammers, they throw two by fours at it, and it takes some time. I think Haley Strategic actually had a video on their channel about it. It's also if you live somewhere that has hurricanes or tornadoes, if you do that in the for waiting for like two by four flying through the windows, oh, yeah. Yes. Great point. And that way the window won't shatter. Because they always say don't stand near a window during a thunderstorm. It's not the wind that's going to get you. It's what the wind is blowing that's going to get you. And then the glass breaking. Great point. Yeah, question. Uh, location of your handgun in the house. Yeah. You How many handguns? <laughs> how many rooms, how many handguns? Uh, well, one could argue the best location for a handgun for easy access is on your person. So who carries a handgun with them while they're in their house, on their body? Probably not many. But if you want my answer, that's the best place to carry a handgun is on you at all times. But realistically, that's not going to happen. The next question becomes, and these are rhetorical, so... I didn't talk about it up here, but operational security is a real thing. At no point, I said don't advertise. Don't tell me, especially because we're on film, don't tell me what, your, what you have and what your security measures are at your house and what your security system is and stuff. Not that I'm going to come and do anything, but this video is going to go out. And obviously you guys aren't on film, which is a good thing. There's a reason for that. But don't advertise to people you know. I love my family to death, but there are certain members of my family 
when you get on a bus at an amusement park and you're all riding the bus in together to the amusement park, oh my God, do they tell them their life story. Hey, yeah, you know, we just came from such and such and we're going to be here this long and there's so many people in our family and this is where we came from. It's like, Would you just shut up? Or at least give them false information. How many of you have a, a fake name that you give at the drive through window? Consider it. Consider giving it. No, nobody's going to check your license. Nobody's checking. But when you go to Starbucks, oh, make sure it's, uh, it's actually Karen with a Y. I use Karen. I apologize if there's Karen in the room. But Karen with a Y. You know, it's like, okay, well, now I know what to look for when I Google your name on the internet. Use a fake name. There's nobody checking that stuff. So as far as where you put a handgun on the home, consider who has access to your home legally, who has the right to be there, how old are they, what is their level of comprehension. If you've got young children, there's laws that state you have to secure those so those people cannot have access to them without your permission or without the permission of the parent. Secure them in such a manner that they are accessible when you need them, right? Don't go sticking it under the coffee table if you're in the living room and the coffee table is in the study. Put it where you're going to be most often, but secure it in a manner that makes sense for the people in your home. Don't just leave a loaded handgun on the cushion of a couch. Real story. I had a friend that went to Lowe's and their child found a loaded handgun on the outdoor furniture at Lowe's that was on display. Loaded handgun right there, boop, right in between the cushions. So do you think that firearm was secured on that person when they sat down? No, probably not. Your home should be no different. Secure it, but consider who has access to your home, where you spend the most time, and if you, you know, how far are you from the point of entry that you feel may be most likely? Front door, 34% of the time. How far are you from the front door? If you've got enough time to get up and get to something because you're four rooms away, then maybe it doesn't need to be as accessible. Consider it doesn't need to be low. But don't put a shotgun on top of the fridge. That's just cliche. <laughs> and apparently criminals check freezers for everything, so yeah. don't put it in there either. Question? So I've got a comment about fire extinguishers. Okay. All right. Pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. Pass. That's what we were all taught in elementary school. But pass where? <laughs> yeah, to your point. Base the flame. Top of the flame doesn't do anything. It looks really pretty up there, right? Really cool. That's what we all love when we light a campfire. That's not where the fuel source is. The fuel source is wherever the flames are originating from. Also understand, sticking with fire extinguishers, there are different classifications of fire extinguisher based on whether it's oh, biological, chemical, or electrical, I think, are the three or something like that. Basically, is it a fuel source like wood? Is it a fuel source like an electric fire? Or is it a fuel source like a grease fire? Those are all treated differently. Don't put water on a grease fire, right? If it's in a pan, snuff it out. Pretty easy. But make sure you have a fire extinguisher that's rated for whatever you're trying to put out. Questions, comments? Some good information here tonight. And if, if nothing else, what you've just heard here at the end is network. You are all here tonight. You made the decision not only to come, but you drove, you used resources. Fuel, gas ain't cheap. You came all the way down here. You're all like-minded to some degree. Share knowledge with each other. Whether it's here in room, you, hey, I'm going to be on such and such a forum. Go hit me up there. Exchange numbers. Do whatever you want. You can build a network, and it could start in this room potentially. Doesn't mean you have to say, hey, we're all meeting at the same place, but it's like, you know what? You've got a cell phone. I've got a cell phone. We live on opposite sides of the city. If shit gets bad over there, do you mind just throw me a text? Like if a tornado comes through and starts in your community and is eventually headed toward Mont, can you just let me know? It can be that easy. You're all here tonight. You're all like-minded to some degree. Don't advertise what you have. Please don't advertise what you have. <laughs>